fellow of the British Welding Institute, a professional engineer, last year's recipient of the Samuel Wiley Miller Award, which is the most prestigious award in the society. He's been an editor and an author for 50 years. He's attended every welding show since 1935. And, well, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Mr. Welding in the Chicago section and in the world, Ted Jones. It's uh, certainly great to see such a, a large group out here tonight. I didn't expect this big a crowd. In fact, I didn't think anyone would be here, so I left all my notes in the office when I came out this afternoon. But anyway, I want to talk to you about the history of welding, but before I get into that, I'd like to give you a little background on the Chicago section, the American Welding Society. As uh, you know, the American Welding Society started in 1919, and uh, if we had had this meeting 36 days earlier this year, we could have uh, celebrated the 67th birthday of the Chicago section. While the society started on March 28, 1919, and the first section was the Philadelphia section, which started about a year later, in March 1920. And on August 3rd, 1920, the Chicago section, which is the second section of AWS, uh, started its activities. And it's been going strong ever since. I note that there are some old timers around here, but. Uh, that have uh, been with the section as long or longer than I have because part of my time was out of the Chicago area. But uh, it's uh, been an interesting experience and uh, the Chicago section has contributed much to the American Welding Society. I don't know whether you fellows are aware of it or not, but. Uh, uh, the first uh, president of the Chicago section was uh, back, uh, Harry Boardman, back in uh, 1939, 1938. Harry was uh, director of research for Chicago Bridge. And I don't know quite what politics he pulled, but the next year his boss was a president of the Welding Society, uh, George Horton. And later on, we had other members that uh, became president of the society. Uh, Eric Seabloom, who was director of welding research at Crane Company, would have been the president in 1954, but unfortunately, Eric died of a heart attack in uh, 53, just prior to being to the election. So. He didn't serve us as a president. He did serve as vice president for two years, uh, working towards that goal. Our next uh, member that became a president was Al Chenard, who was president in 1960. And then in 1965, Jay Bland was president. Jay actually wasn't in the Chicago area at that time, but he had been I'm not sure he was associated with Standard Oil either before or after that period of time, but when he was president, he was with the uh, atomic, uh, the Knowles Atomic Laboratory of General Electric. In uh, about 1973, Roy Becker was the president of the society, and he also was a past chairman of the Chicago section at one time. Last uh, spring, when the Welding Society was meeting here, 
We had uh, a party, as you will recall, it was a gangster's night at the Hilton Towers, they call it now. It's hard to think of it as other than the Stevens. It was a Stevens for so many years, and many of our welding conventions were held at the Stevens Hotel. And uh, while the, the gangster's night, or whatever you call it, was uh, kind of a, a disappointment, we had a big disappointment back in 1939 when the uh, welding convention was being held in Chicago. At that time, the convention was not a separate welding show as we have it now, a welding show and convention. They had the, the annual meeting of the Welding Society and uh, the Metal Congress or Metal Exposition or whatever you want to call it that was put on by the American Society for Metals, ASM. And uh, we had uh, our activities in conjunction with the Metal Society. But uh, in 1939, they really were going to have the show to, to end all shows or something. And they got the boulevard room, and it was a man, men only affair. It was a, a night in the weldery, they called it. And they were going to have six qualified operators, I don't know what kind of operators they were, that were going to uh, put on the show. Uh, there were going to be no cover beads. Uh, bring your hard rod. <laughs> and uh, a lot of other connotations that sounded like a real interesting evening. And the tickets were a dollar apiece. The show was to start at 10 o'clock and was going to run to one. Well, about... Uh, 10 minutes to 10, Fritz Hendricks, who worked for the Welding Engineer magazine, came running in and says, the cops are out there, there's no show tonight. <laughs> and there was a hell of a disappointed crowd. But that's one of the activities that uh, we put on in the Chicago area. Uh, four years later, we had the the Welding Society had their annual meeting here again, and the Chicago Sun-Times, the Chicago Daily News, had a reporter down to one of the sessions, which was the uh, ship research section, and the next day he came out with a, quite a piece in the Chicago Daily News pointing out that the welding was no damn good because all the ships that they welded busted up. That's uh, all that they were talking about were ship weld failures in the sh shipping business uh, during uh, World War II. And as a consequence, uh, we got quite a write-up in the Daily News telling about uh, how lousy welding was at uh, that time. Well, I waited uh, for a long time. I was editor of Welding Engineer at the time. I waited a week or so after the uh, show was over, the annual meeting was over, hoping that someone in the Welding Society would come up and refute the uh, failure picture so far as uh, welding was concerned. No one said anything, so finally I called up the Daily News and requested equal space and uh, surprisingly, I got it. So I had uh, quite a story pointing out that uh, up till that time, about six ships had broken in two as a result of uh, weld failures. But uh, there's some, uh, several thousand had uh, successfully done what they were supposed to do. Back in, uh, during World War Two, we built a lot of ships. In uh, World War I, it took an average of 246 days to build a 10,000 ton, 440 foot long uh, cargo vessel. And in World War II, we started building the same ships, except instead of riveting them, we welded them. 
and the initial ships that uh, were kind of lousy because we used the uh, plans for a riveted ship and instead of uh, uh, butting the plates together, we lapped them over just like we they, they did when we were building uh, riveted boats. And as a consequence, they were wasting a lot of steel and the like, but finally they got around to it so that they could weld the same size ship that it took 246 days in World War I. In World War II, we were doing it in about the average, uh, the average time was uh, in some shipyards was as little as 27 and a half days. In all the shipyards across the country, they were building them in 52 days. And before the war was over, we had built some 4,600 uh, welded ships. The, they called them Liberty ships, and then later they changed them to Victory ships, a little different design. And we did have weld failures. We had failures. It, they weren't weld failures. They, they were uh, stress risers that, uh, because of the way the hatches and the bulkheads were put in, and uh, 16 ships failed at sea. But uh, several, several of those that broke in two, they welded them back together and uh, put them back into service. So welding did a terrific job. and. I had to point that out. We've always had gripes with the Welding Society for some reason in the Chicago section, and, and uh, many of them were le legitimate. I think it all dates back to the fact that we were the second section, and the New York was the fourth section. They did, we came in, and as I mentioned earlier, August the 3rd, 1920, the New York section didn't wasn't established until October. In the meantime, on the 28th of August in 1920, why the Philadelphia section started. So we had uh, four sections the first year, and uh, the it used to be that we had a annual meeting here every four years. We kind of got away from that. In 1953, the Welding Society decided to have their own show, a spring show. At that time, they were having two meetings a year, the spring meeting and then the annual fall meeting. And the spring show, they had it in 1953. The meeting was at the Shamrock Hotel in Houston. And uh, there were 400 people attended that. In 1956, they had the the uh, last uh, welding show with ASM. In 1957, they started having the uh, welding sh shows and annual meetings at the same time. The first one was in Philadelphia for the spring meeting. And uh, in 63, we had a a welding show and annual meeting here. We had another, that was the held at McCormick Place. That was the first show that we had in McCormick Place. In 67, we had one out at uh, the stockyards where they used to always hold the metal shows when they came to town. And then in 73, we had a welding show, which is the last one until the one that was just here. There was four, a 14-year pause between shows. Now that's a kind of a, a brief history of the welding, Chicago section, the American Welding Society. And it's, it's been a lot of fun uh, being a member all of these years. And, and uh, Bill Crasp over there, he remembers a lot of these early day meetings, and some of you young kids around here will remember the more recent meetings. And it's certainly good to see uh, so many chairmen out here tonight that, that uh, know uh, pretty as much about this business as I do, or some of you know more, I'm sure. Well, now I'll get into the, the history of welding, and we will have some slides in connection with this.
Mr. Cameraman, it looks like we're in the middle of some battles. Okay, sir. Yeah, go right over there. I'll follow you over. This is a Fouché torch. Uh, Fouché was a Frenchman who more or less discovered welding, and this is one of the first torches that he made. I was in Paris one time and saw this in a flea market, uh, and the people that uh, had it didn't know what it was. I immediately identified, knew what it was, so I picked it up for a, a song, so to speak. And uh, this is it, one of the first welding torches, about 1900. We have, here's a, an old regulator that uh, looks somewhat different than the regulators. Just keep that up. Somewhat different than the regulators we have today, but it uh, serves the same purpose. The amazing thing about uh, gas welding apparatus, the fellows apparently did a good job at this very start, and uh, you won't find a lot of evolution in the apparatus on this table. They seem to look very similar no matter what age. Yeah. The Show me an old one here. and a real new one. Here's the newest torch here, and uh, then you get uh, this one uh, is an old torch. You can see that it has a corrugated uh, tip, which is a radiator to dissipate the heat quickly. But uh, essentially, they're the same thing. The people that hold that tip again, that, uh, just hold it still. Corrugated tip to give you a radiator effect here, to radiate the heat out. So that, uh, now, uh, this is a modern torch. Pull it right next to it. Put it right up next to it smaller, neater. The only thing they've done in the torch line is uh, cosmetically. They've made them a little um, lighter in weight and more efficient. But other than that, I don't know why this is an early day torch, why they had it so long. Uh, I think they wanted to keep the welder a good distance away from his work. But this is a pre-welding torch, we might say. Uh, it's an aerocetylene torch that was used for brazing. About 1880 was when this uh, type of equipment was involved. This was before the oxyacetylene uh, method came into being, and before we had a cheap uh, acetylene operation, production operation. The hydrogen, and air. Well, thank you for going over the uh, display, and now we'll go into your slideshow. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Jefferson. A pleasure to meet you with the camera. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, and I hope that I can do a job for you tonight. Thank you. What? That's the end. I'm going the wrong way, I guess. Do I focus it, or is it? Yeah, there is a focus there. Oh, you got it? Yeah, can't you focus it right here? Don't go around. That's Okay. Well, we see there, going back to uh, whatever it is, 19, about 19, uh, 18, uh, 80. We start out, we have, this is a various and sundry welding process that have come into the, uh, being in the last uh, 60 or the last 100 years, we'll say. Uh, actually, welding started out in 1887, so we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of welding. The first patents were issued in 1887 on arc welding. Uh, 
prior to that, oh, a lot of people said uh, that uh, anybody would come out to this meeting, I mean, one of the past chairmen told me that anyone come out and hear me talk would be a nut. And so I thought it would be, since you fellas are going to go from here out to the zoo, it would be well to have uh, know what a squirrel is so that you can dodge them. <laughs> Uh, Eighty percent of the welding that's done in this country is done in the 13 states that you see there. Uh, Illinois plays a very important role in welding, and uh, that picture is changing somewhat. That was based on the 1980 census, and since then there's a lot of welding has moved to, to the south, and uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, some of those... Uh, uh, states are would be included, and uh, some of the New England states have lost a little ground in that. I'm sorry, folks. Oh, uh, you know, people that are interested in welding, they they don't take enough time to smell the roses. So, I thought we should have some. <laughs> roses on here so that you could uh, really take more time. I know that uh, I have spent uh, 69 years in welding, and uh, practically the history of welding is my life's history, really. So uh, take a little time to smell the roses. Uh, in 1986, we celebrated the the uh, rebirth of the Statue of Liberty. The original framework of that was uh, forge welded, but in this last time, welding played a very important role in renewing the Statue of Liberty. And because it's inert gas and it's tungsten and it's welding, so I and it's, so it's TIG as far as I'm concerned. Well, when I heard that Russ Meredith, who worked at uh, Northrop Aircraft out in uh, Los Angeles, was welding aluminum using a, a helium and a tungsten electrode, uh, I thought, well, gee, he's really got a great idea. Uh, up at Fort Peck, I had a lot of containers to weld, tanks that were, were made out of aluminum and we were gas welding them. Uh, we had an awful time when we used a, a bare electrode and, and a flux uh, that they suggested to use with the, the bare rod, welding rod, rather, and the flux that they suggest we use with it. So we found that we could weld it pretty good using a, a coated arc welding electrode and a gas torch. But if uh, Russ Meredith could weld it with a TIG torch using helium and uh, tungsten. Well, there was no reason why we couldn't do it, so I fixed myself up a TIG torch. I took a, a cutting torch and uh, cut, cut it up a little, uh, welded a, an end on it uh, over on the right-hand side there so you could hook a cable to it. Uh, drilled a hole through the cutting tip, uh, where, which would be the oxygen hole for cutting, enlarged that and put a tungsten electrode in there, and uh, put a wood handle on it and some friction tape, and I made myself a TIG torch, getting some helium. I'm uh, sorry to say that that wasn't one of the profound inventions of 1940. But I still have the torch, and you can look at it back here on the table as you, as you go out. <clears throat> I must be going the wrong way. I thought you wanted to see that torch again anyway. <laughs> here is another one of Russ Meredith's torches. Uh, he refined that some. Finally, Lindy bought it, and they called it Heliarch. And, uh, then the Welding Society really came out with a, 
a good name for it, uh, non-consumable, inert gas shielded uh, arc welding. Well, that was too long for me. So in 1953, I wanted to shorten up that expression in my writings, so I called that TIG. And then, uh, with some reluctance, I called uh, metal inert gas welding MIG, because I, d I was reluctant to call it MIG because the damn Japanese fighting planes were MIGs. And uh, I didn't want to glorify them, but uh, I'm having a tough time glorifying MIG, although it is used all over the world except in the U.S. Someday the American Welding Society will catch up with the rest of the world. <clears throat> Here is the original rectifier welder. Uh, this is a, a Tungar vacuum tube welder that was made by Alice Chalmers in the early 40s and uh, was uh, really the first uh, rectifier type welder they rect uh, using a vacuum tube to, to rectify DC or AC to get DC uh, I'm I'm sorry I I get so engrossed in watching the picture I don't look at the buttons I punch here is uh, probably the first MIG gun. This was made down in Battelle uh, Memorial Lab in uh, Columbus, Ohio, on a, uh, a project that Airco sent them on. And uh, Howard Carey, who was later to become vice president of uh, Hobart and their applied their power systems and runs our school down there and the like. He worked on that. Uh, here is an early day MIG uh, TIG operation. No, that's, that's a MIG operation. Here is a TIG operation where it's a little cart that uh, a package deal. That, well, Hobart came out with a fine wire uh, welding process. They call it micro wire. And, then we came fine wire. That was in about 1956, something like that. Getting back to uh, getting away from arc welding and going to gas welding, uh, here are some uh, welding torches. I have most of these here on the table back here. That early torch is a Fouché torch, uh, built in about 1900. That's when we learned about uh, oxyacetylene welding. Uh, oxyacetylene was first discovered about 19, 1860, in the 1860s, but uh, there wasn't any uh, cheap way of making it. They couldn't make it in quantities uh, because uh, they didn't have uh, materials to make it from. It, it's, it's a gas that's given off when the calcium carbide and water are mixed or potassium carbide or something of that sort. And uh, they, they just didn't, didn't know how to make uh, calcium carbide or potassium carbide. And a fellow, Dr. Moorhead, uh, Major Moorhead rather, Turner Moorhead had an aluminum plant down in Spray, North Carolina, and uh, they were trying to make metallic calcium. He had a fellow with him, uh, Thomas Wilson, who was, came down from Canada. Up in Canada, uh, Wilson had been playing around trying to make calcium, and, and they thought he had the, uh, the means of doing it, so he hooked up with Moorhead, and they would mix this uh, uh, limestone and and carbon and uh, coal tar in uh, and uh, cook it in an electric furnace and come up and they thought they were going to come up with metallic calcium but they kept coming up with 
a brittle stuff that they didn't know what it was. And uh, one day they were emptying the the pot that this uh, brittle junk was in, and it uh, it was red hot. They were, and some of it fell into a bucket of water, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, one of these clinkers that was standing up there, still red hot, uh, started a fire, and it developed that the granulars that were below water were giving off a gas, and they realized all of a sudden that they had, uh, had a settling, uh, and a, a cheap way of making it. Well, that was uh, very fortunate, because just about the same time, uh, von Linder, that's uh, L-I-N-D-E, but in German, they, they call it Linder rather than Lindy, as we call it here, Von Linder came, he was in the refrigerator business, and he came up with a way of liquefying air. And uh, he found that by boiling the liquid air off at various temperatures, he could get oxygen and, and nitrogen and, and other gases. And so he came up with a, an inexpensive way of producing uh, oxygen. So now we had two ingredients together, oxygen and acetylene. And uh, Fouché, he was playing around in with these two elements and found out that he could produce a flame that was hotter than any flame that had ever been produced before and that it would melt and cut metals and the like of that. So he started around uh, playing around with welding, uh, basically cutting at first because it, it was severing, severing metals that uh, it would do so easily. Uh, here we have other types of uh, torches. Uh, maybe I should go back a minute. Uh, we, we have the Fouché torch there. Uh, down below that is uh, the torches that uh, they started making along about uh, 1908, 1909. And uh, you go down, the last torch is a, a torch that was made uh, 10 years ago, the bottom torch. As you can see that there's not a lot of difference in the torches. And you look at some of these that I have over here, and you'll find that uh, there's not uh, much difference between the early day torch and uh, the later day torch, except uh, cosmetically, they've been uh, made a lot prettier and, and neater and, and the like of that. Uh, here the top torch is uh, an air acetylene uh, heating type torch. The second torch is a, an air hydrogen torch. That uh, torch dates back to about 1880, somewhere along there. Prior to oxyacetylene welding, why everything they did was uh, either forge welding or they could braze using hydrogen and uh, air. The hydrogen was introduced and the air was sucked in by uh, Venturi effect uh, so as to give you a mixture and, and a hot flame. Then yeah, there's a 